of all the four Gospels, <coughs> excuse me, of all the four Gospels, John's accounting of these events is by far the most brief. Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of them spend considerable time to look at Jesus in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, they present us with that infamous kiss of Judas, which John doesn't even bother to mention. Um, they present us with words that are exchanged between Jesus and Judas. And John really washes over all of that and just presents the, the confrontation that Jesus had with those who had come to seize him. Now, some have argued from this that there is a discordance between the Gospels, suggesting that the events recorded by Matthew, Mark, or Luke don't fit into John's records or re recollection of these same events. Uh, I'm not just talking about those, uh, I think, discredited folk who would even try to challenge the, the uh, Johannan authorship of the gospel, but those who would call themselves believers in the word of God and yet dispute that these things are inerrant uh, and true. They would say, for example, if you look at Mark 14, when he records the same events, uh, he indicates this thing which happens that John doesn't mention. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs, who were from the chief priests and scribes and elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a sig signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him, and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. They would say, this event doesn't fit with what John's saying. John does not say that Judas immediately went to Jesus and kissed him and betrayed him, and then Jesus was seized. He presents Jesus coming out to those who were confronting him in order to, uh, to challenge them. Now, I'm not going to defense... Sorry, I'm not going to devote a lot of time here to defending the inerrancy of Scripture, but I think it is important, especially, you know, uh, for those who are maybe younger or newer to the faith, to, to actually have an answer to these charges. And we need to understand that these are eyewitness accounts and that their variance is actually evidence of their authenticity. Um, but the distinctiveness of them does not mean that they are not all true. Matthew, Mark, and Luke report the time of prayer in the garden with slightly different dialogue. Some of them note that those who come to see, to seize Jesus rather are armed. Others don't mention that they're armed. John actually gives us clarity as to who these men are more than any of the other Gospels, presenting the... Uh, the fact that they are both Roman soldiers and temple guards, um, which others don't mention at all. Mark simply says they're men from the high priests. That's not untrue in either case. It's the high priests who sent them. Um, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mentioning that Jesus, Judas approached Jesus immediately to kiss him as a signal uh, to those soldiers that he was to be seized. Um, Matthew and Luke both record different things that Jesus said in response to that to Judas, and Mark reports nothing at all. But that doesn't mean that there's a disagreement. None of these are trying to report everything that was said and done as though they're court stenographers. That's not the nature of the Gospels. That's not the type of report that they are. They're reporting likely minutes-long conversations and sometimes substantively instead of with quotation. It's 
like if you were to leave here and someone were to ask you, what did the pastor preach this morning? And you said, one of you, um, he said that the scriptures are inerrant. And another person, when asked, said, well, he said that the gospels are all eyewitness accounts. And another person, when asked, didn't mention this introduction at all, but simply went on to uh, some of the more substantive points in it, you would all be telling the truth, and none of you would actually be quoting me exactly in anything that I said. See, part of our problem is that the academics who criticize these Gospels are applying the rules that they have made for themselves for the writing of history with exact citation and footnoting of every uh, point, which they didn't exist until probably the 19th century in, in rudimentary form. And they're expecting that somehow the fact that the Gospels don't conform to that style of writing makes them inferior, false, lies, like it's nonsense. Um, but rather, these are eyewitness accounts. They are all true. They are not in contradiction with one another. And when we devote ourselves to simply trying to harmonize these things, we're actually missing entirely the point that these discrepancies in what is reported are not, to use the tech term, a bug. They are a feature. <laughs> They're meant to be there. They're actually important. We, we need to actually pay attention when there's a difference in the reporting. Now, if you want a harmonization of, of these Gospels in regards to what took place here, it's not even remotely difficult to do, right? So Judas arrived at the garden with people behind him, a mob, and all of the gospel writers agree with that. Judas immediately went to Jesus and kissed him on the cheek. Uh, he betrayed him to those behind him. And before he was seized, he confronted the crowd, as John here says, and says, who are you looking for? And then those soldiers said, Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I am he. They fell on their faces and then he asked them another time, and he said, I am he, only let these others go. And then they seized him, and then Peter <coughs> took out his sword and struck the ear off of the slave of the high priest. It's not complicated. And yet that's not really what we should be giving our attention to this morning. We should be giving our attention to what John is relating to us when he skips over all of those details. Pay attention and look at the first 11 verses of John 18. What exactly has John said here? He went forth. He entered the garden, which Judas knew. Judas comes with the armed mob. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth. He said, whom do you seek? He said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell on the ground, not seizing him immediately. Therefore, again, he asked them, whom do you seek? When they repeated that it was Jesus of Nazarene, he answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way. What is John trying to show us here? Surely you can get the reason that he does not recount all of those same details, which those uh, gospel writers who wrote probably some 30 years before this uh, or more uh, have already reported. The, the details, if you were to go into them, would actually muddy the waters and, and sort of obscure the clarity that he wants us to see about Jesus actively entering into his own betrayal, his own arrest, and of course, what subsequently followed. That he did with full knowledge embrace and actively go forth to obey the Father's will 
in doing these things. You see, the variants exist because the other four Gospels, they want us to focus on the injustice of this horrible act. And so, rightly, they draw our attention to the agonies of the perfect Son of Man and Son of God in the garden, where he, with perfect foreknowledge of the suffering he is about to receive on behalf of you and I, and all who would ever believe in him, that he is in torment of the soul, that he is in, in great distress, bodily distress, even because of the greatness of his emotional and spiritual distress. We are to see him crying out to his father that if it be possible, this cup might be removed from me so that we might recognize the severity of his pain at coming into this place and accepting that cup. We are to see the failure of his own disciples to stand with him in vigil and prayer during that time of deep distress. We're to look and to see the way in which an angel had to come and to minister to him, to comfort him in the severity of that distress. We're to see the one who was his friend coming to him and the horrible injustice of this one who he had done nothing to but love and share of himself to going to him and with a kiss betraying him to death for the sake of a few men's venal lust for power and control over the religious life of the Jews. That's what they wanted us to see. That's what the Holy Spirit wanted us to see. And those Gospels went forth first that we might first see the horrible injustice of the Son of God, the Creator of man, dying through the betrayal of his own friends while he sustains them with the power of his words. And that's what Hebrews says. And John wants us to see that he went willingly into that space actively he willingly identified himself so much is John uh, showing us that he was willing that he more or less had to force the men who had come for him to arrest him he had to convince them that he was not going to resist so that they could find the courage in themselves to do this act of wickedness. Now, I suppose I should maybe just say why that would be, because it might seem strange to you, or you might imagine something miraculous at work here as though the transfiguration is happening in these men's presence. Um, but you just need to understand the context. We sometimes falsely imagine that if these were Roman soldiers or temple guards, they were probably irreligious men, but that is the farthest thing from reality. Uh, those who are here from the Roman cohort, by the way, the, the word that John uses, spirin, to define them, sometimes translated just a band of men, it is an actual... Uh, title for a portion of a legion. It refers to a cohort, one-tenth of a legion, and it is 600 men, uh, thereabouts, depending on the strength, obviously, of the legion. It would have been the cohort at Fort Fortress Antonius, which has come out, probably not all of it, um, well, certainly not all of it. There would have been the remaining guard, no matter what was going on. But we don't know. I mean, certainly it's possible that the bulk of the cohort did go forth because they were expecting possibly a real um, rebellion here, uh, like a, a full-on incitement to rebellion because of the messianic fever that had seized Jerusalem. But these men, far from being irreligious, were, were very religious, polytheistic worshippers of many gods. 
Uh, I don't think Josephus was lying when he presented that Titus at the destruction of the temple, when it went up in flames, was terrified because he thought, I have just incited the wrath of Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, against myself. And he immediately offered sacrifice to, to Jehovah, saying, you know, take this away from me and put it on those who force me to breach these walls and to fight here. Because these men believed that Jehovah, Yahweh, was truly a God, at the very least, among gods, and a powerful God. And these men also believed in demigods. They believed that gods could have sons on the earth. And, you know, they absolutely heard the rumors, at the very least, that this man had been going around giving sight to men born blind, raising men from the dead. They don't want to get into a fight with the literal son of a god. So yeah, they're, they're legitimately afraid. And so when they come, and he's not cowed at all, but he goes and says, who are you looking for? I am he. Yeah, they're scared. Because if this man, who is the son of a god, does not smite us down, we know what the God of the Israelites has done in the past to those who crossed him. Uh, we don't want to arrest his son if that's really him. This is scary. By the way, uh, a good number of them probably were actually worshippers of Jehovah, of Yahweh. Uh, we certainly see Cornelius, who would have been among their number probably, uh, if it wasn't with this cohort. He was part of the same legion, almost surely. You know, there were many like him who seemed to have been uh, impressed by the worship of gods who may have devoted themselves to that. The temple guards certainly believed that God was real, and they also would have wondered, surely, is this actually the Messiah? We know that they weren't entirely all that enthusiastic earlier on when the same chief priests and scribes and Pharisees had sent them to arrest Jesus. They came back, this is John 7, 45 to 46. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? And they answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The concern, like, I don't want to arrest this guy because he seems like he might be who he says he is. So yeah, they're afraid. And then Jesus has to convince them that he is not going to resist. He tells them, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way to indicate that if he, they let the other apostles who are with him go away safely, that he's going to surrender himself into their custody without any fight. John wants us to focus on the fact that Jesus is walking into this betrayal, trial, torture, and death knowingly and of his own will in obedience to the Father's will. Even the words that John records him saying to Peter are those which indicate this very thing, where Matthew focuses on Jesus speaking about his power and authority to resist by calling legions of angels from heaven, if he so desired, John reports simply this line, Jesus saying to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So the Holy Spirit wants us to see this morning this great example of submission to the Father's will, of active entrance into trial, pain, betrayal, and loss, for the sake of those he wants us to serve. Us. You might say, what do you mean? That we're talking about Jesus. Jesus sacrificing for those that the Father wanted him to serve. What's this got to do with us? Philippians 2, 5-8 says to us, 
have this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Have this attitude in ourselves that was in Christ Jesus when he went to the garden where Judas knew he would be to go and arrest him, to betray him. Where Jesus went and entered into that battle with his own temptation to live. Where Jesus went to go and to face those who wanted to destroy him. We would be fools to imagine that we are great heroes who could ever have done what Christ did. Being unworthy sacrifices ourselves, we could not offer ourselves to save another. But we are to have this same attitude as Christ, which he had in offering himself. So how are we to have the attitude of Christ in his obedience? Let us look at Christ approaching his own sacrifice. First, he went forth knowing. Second, he declared himself to his enemies. And third, he accepted. First, he went forth knowing. Second, he declared himself to his enemies. And third, he accepted. So he went forth knowing. He went forth when he had finished praying to the Father for himself and for us, and for the union that he desired for us with himself in one another. He went forth and he knew full well what was coming. Do we make the mistake of ignoring the humanity of Christ when we read these things? This is not written in contradiction of the other Gospels which describe the agonies of Christ, but in further clarification of them. This is what we received from the other Gospels which took place in that garden that he went to. Matthew writes, and he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell onto his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Mark writes, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And Luke tells us, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Do you really think that our sorrows and our fears are somehow worse than those of Jesus in these last moments? That our hurts and betrayals are greater than those he willingly went into? We have trials, I. And most of them are tainted with our own sin to have at least partially caused them for ourselves. They seem often too great for us to overcome, but we must follow the example of our Lord who did not take the counsel of his own fears and pains, but simply went where he knew he must go to receive what the Father had for him. And there, having gone, he fell on his face and he prayed. Now, 
Let us be clear what Jesus is facing when he goes into the garden. He is facing temptation. He is facing temptation to do what? Something other than what his Father's will is for him. So what would that be called? Sin. If that troubles you, (laughs) then you underappreciate the humanity of Christ. I am not speaking some unbiblical heresy here. Hebrews 2.18 says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus did not yield an inch to his temptation, but he had it. He faced it. He didn't sin when he prayed for, if possible, another way, another path. For he remained in the Father's will and in submission to the Father's will in that. But can you understand and appreciate that walking across the Kidron Ravine, it's a very short stroll to the Garden of Gethsemane, by the way, a few hundred meters probably from where he was at the, uh, the upper room. But every step would have been forging against a vast current of temptation to just not go. Jesus' nature was not born uh, with sin as we were in the same way as we are. His nature, of course, fully human, fully God. And yet, his nature was as ours. He was made for a little while lower than the angels. He was perfected in suffering. Hebrews 5, 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Obedience to that which his human weakness rebelled against, and which his human weakness urged him forcefully not to embrace. Speaking of the sin nature in believers, John Owen aptly describes that believers have experience of the power of indwelling sin. They find in themselves that sin and they find it as a law. He that swims against the stream finds it to be strong, but he that rolls along with it is insensible to it. What he means, of course, is that if we are in Christ seeking to to do what is good, we find the law of sin in ourselves that is dragging us to do anything other than that. That no one who is outside of Christ really understands because they just bob along in the stream and let it take them where it wants. They think they're making resistance against it when they swim a little to the left or to the right in the same direction that they are being taken. I'm not saying that Jesus had, in the same way as we do, indwelling sin. He did not have habits of sin that had to be defeated because he had never once given in to temptation. We struggle against things that we have nurtured and let take deep root in ourselves. And so our battle against sin is certainly a different kind or a different experience than Christ's was. Uh, He having never had the root of sin in himself, which we... have nurtured over many years, and yet it is in type exactly the same. 
The temptation that Jesus faced was as our temptations are. So when he went forth with his disciples to the garden, and he entered that garden knowing that this was the place of his destruction, it was a fierce battle against temptation. Now there is a wisdom that comes from above, and there is a wisdom that comes from below. Which wisdom says, when faced with temptation to avoid doing what God has commanded us, I'm not strong enough, I'm too tired, I've done enough, I just need some time to get my head right. Which wisdom says, stop fighting for a bit and drift on the current? Is that the wisdom from above? You might no. misunderstand me. You might think I'm saying, oh, then you must do more than you are doing. You must, you must push yourself into good works as though they would save you, as though they would justify you, as though they would substantiate that you are truly Christ's in some way. Not at all. What I'm telling you and myself is that when we know that God has commanded something and we will not do it because we have some justification as to why that would hurt too much or be too hard, we condemn ourselves as being outside the will of the Father, outside the example that Christ has given for us. I fear that we Christians very often choose to avoid the things which are hardest by substituting something else which we consider to be good and righteous. How hard do you think it is to go to someone who you have hurt and repent? Jesus said, therefore, this is Matthew 5, 23 to 24, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Or how about this one? How hard is this? Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Who wants to go and confess to someone that they have hurt? Who wants to be vulnerable to someone who has hurt them, giving them another opportunity by forgiving and seeking reconciliation? Who wants to actually approach somebody who has sinned against them, seeking their restoration, and then go through the process for their soul's sake of challenging them with two or three witnesses, of then maybe bringing them before the church, seeking their repentance, and if they will not repent, removing them so that perhaps they might be taught not to embrace the practice of sin or the resistance against righteousness for their sake, those are not comfortable things. Those are really, 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 really hard. And our whole nature screams out against doing them. It is like 
swimming against a waterfall to go into those spaces of relationship with one another and to seek love and unity, which is what Christ prayed for and then went to the garden to accomplish. And so what do we do? So often we go and we rush off and we do other things and we say it's good enough. It's good enough. Just like it would have been fine for Jesus to do something else that was righteous, right? Could he not have just... I know that I have to go and I have to accept the, the payment of sin for all mankind who would ever believe in me. But... You know, if I just go heal some more blind people, feed some more of the poor, that'll be good enough, right? That's also the Father's will, right? I know that's good. Well, we would all be destined to hell if that was what Jesus had done. If he had devoted himself to just more discipling, to more teaching and winning of converts to his cause, then there would be no hope on this earth. Not because those are wrong things, but because they are not the right thing that God the Father purposed for him to do for the salvation of mankind. May the Holy Spirit place upon our hearts the wisdom to see where we need to die to ourself and to our self-rule to be in submission to what God has given us to do, that we would be in union and love towards one another and in right relationship with the world. We must go. We must do the things we don't want to do because they hurt, but which we know are right which we know are necessary if we are to be ambassadors of Christ and reflections of his love and his submission. Secondly, he didn't just go and fight against the current. He declared himself to his enemies. He declared himself to his enemies. Though Jesus did not invite or incite his own seizure, he did not shrink from declaring himself from directly to those who were seeking him, to harm him, to take him before the courts, the kangaroo court where he would be tortured, tormented, mocked, ridiculed, and killed. And he had perfect foreknowledge of this, as John says, yet he went and he said, whom are you seeking and then he said, I am he, twice. In this example of our Lord, we need to recognize that we must also be forthright in our fealty to Christ. Jesus did not hide who he was when he was in Jerusalem. He did not present himself for execution John reports of how he went up to the feast uh, early on in his gospel and he didn't present himself before the temple at first, but then he did. And then he healed the man who was lame at the pool of Bethesda and uh, he confronted those who made false claims against him. He did at various times remove himself from the immediacy of peril in order that he might fulfill the work of his father, but he never lied about who he was. And when he was finally approached for harm, he did not deny himself. And likewise, we must in the world own that we are Christians. We must confess that we are Christ's. We should be known by everyone to be those who believe in Christ, not obstinately, not constantly, not obnoxiously telling people every moment of every day that we are Christians and that we, we want them to be saved and beating them over and over again with, uh, with our concerns for their eternal souls, but they should know who we believe in and what we believe if they have any relationship with us. It should not be possible to be in relationship 
for a month regularly with, with a co-worker and them not have any concept that you might be a Christian. And when then somebody comes and seeks your harm to mock, to hurt, to be angry, to ridicule, maybe even to do physical violence against any representative of Christ, we must not deny him. That is certainly the example that Christ sets for us. 1 Peter 3, uh, 13 to 15. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give account for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Yes, not everyone is gifted uh, or called to the work of an evangelist. We must all proclaim the gospel, but not everyone is called to go stand in the marketplace at Athens and proclaim it with rhetorical arguments to the philosophers of the world. Um, that's fine. You know, seek the gifts, and if that is your gift, then exercise that gift. But you must be one who exudes faith in the presence of all, such that when they see how you act when you are suffering, that they would ask you why you have this hope. What is happening with you that makes you so different? And then you must tell them with gentleness and love exactly why you have a hope that drew them to you. You ought to be telling people so that they know when they are in extreme pain, trial, or suffering that you are a person that they would go to to seek the prayers of that you were a person that they would go to and ask for help and wisdom on the way out. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, but don't we love to stop there in First Peter's exhortation. Yes, even if we should suffer for the sake of righteousness, we are blessed. Yes, we should be ready to testify to anyone who asks and they ought to be asking. But the next verse is kind of important. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Yes, we must declare ourselves to our enemies, to Christ's enemies. But how shall we declare ourselves to them? Is it not first and foremost by lives of integrity, humility, and repentance in the things that he has called us to? Many of those who call themselves Christians will be condemned on the last day. Many of them will stand before that judgment seat and be told, depart from me into the outer darkness, I never knew you. Many have deceived themselves and believe themselves to be in the will of God while they make a secret practice of sin without repentance. Jude says, These are the men who are hidden reefs at your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. To quote again from Dr. Owen, the believer does not make a trade of sin. He has a habitual bent and inclination of the will to do what is good morally and spiritually. There is kept up in believers a constant and ordinarily prevailing will of doing good, notwithstanding the power and the efficacy of indwelling sin. Good book, by the way, John Owen's Indwelling Sin in Believers. Uh, I encourage, if you uh, 
If you need a devotional, it's not long. It's worth your time. Consider this carefully. There are no believers who practice sin. There are no believers for whom the habitual practice is on repentance, in hurting others, in lying, in deceiving, in wounding, in lusting, in, in, in. Another very noteworthy figure in the church declared himself um, <clears throat> to have been in a five-year romantic relationship with a woman who was not his wife in the past few weeks. This man had certainly declared himself to be openly a follower of Christ. He taught the Word of God with great effectiveness for over 30 years, and he did not confess because his conscience convicted him he did not bring himself forward for repentance. He confessed because he was made to confess because he had been found out. Am I better than he is? I've not bothered to go and to listen to what I know is there. Caught a, caught a couple of commentaries. Uh that people had sent my way. Angry words, judging words, obviously. How dare he? He betrayed us all. He betrayed his wife. Am I better than he is? Is there a secret lie or a practice of lust or an enslavement to some idol that I am clinging to? without repentance, that I am not fighting tooth and nail to stand against that riptide that is drawing me away from righteousness? Have I a root of bitterness and hatred towards anyone that I will not surrender? <clears throat> is there unforgiveness unrepentantly in my heart? Hatred towards an enemy instead of love. Galatians 5 lays it out for us pretty clearly. Verses 19 to 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, Disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, partyings, carousings, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Are any of these a trade of mine? A practice that I will defend and justify. Let me just say, and I pray that this would be true, if I had every sin of my heart and thought and deed laid before you, I know I would be ashamed utterly of those things and I would be ashamed to be seen for exactly who I have been in unfaithfulness before Christ but I pray that you would find me hating every one of those sins just as much as you do when we look at them together and that I would not in any way seek to justify defend or minimize a single 
one of them if they were laid out. I pray that for all of us, that we would look at our sin and hate it. Seek to kill it, put it to death, that we would be free of the snare of it. Jesus declared himself and was unashamed. And that seems impossible for us because we know what sinners we are. But we absolutely can do that because what we can do is we can say, as Paul himself said, but in the inner man, I am Christ's. That sin, I hate it. As much as anyone else that looks at it, I hate it. That will not be owned by me. I put it on the cross. It is paid for. <coughs> I am putting it to death. I will not live in that. I will not live for that. May the Holy Spirit put upon our hearts that we would declare ourselves Christ's by the utter rejection of our own sinful temptations. The declaration of evil when it is evil. The love of good that is from God. The wisdom that is from above and not from ourselves. Yeah. That is swimming upstream. That is swimming upstream. I know a lot of men I know myself it's easy to want to be known and loved by God real hard to want to be known and to love those he has called us to love. That's swimming upstream. Well, Jesus didn't simply go and declare himself, but also he accepted what came. He accepted the results. He accepted the cost of obedience to his Father's will. So our third and final point is he accepted. Jesus accepted his betrayal and his unjust seizure, and he did so for those that the Lord had given him. He says so. John reports that right here. That is, that is the purpose of his acceptance for all of those whom the Father had given to him. How are we to follow that attitude in ourselves? Who has the Lord given to you and to me? Each other? To parents, he has given children, and to children, parents. To husbands, wives, and wives, husbands. To brothers, brothers, and sisters. To sisters, and brothers, brothers, and sisters. He has given us neighbors. He has put into our lives all of those whom he has put into our lives that we would love one another serve one another who are in Christ together, that we would walk together towards holiness and good works, that we would live that out in the world in relationship with each one who is not in Christ. Would we accept injustice against ourselves for such as he has given to us? Would we accept betrayal for such as he has given to us? 
Would we fight the temptation to flee from pain and discomfort for the sake of these whom he has given to us? Would we fight the temptation of feeding our flesh and the desires of indwelling sin for the sake of saving those or being a testimony of salvation to those who he has put into our life? How many professors of faith seek very sincerely to be in right relationship with God while refusing to submit to one other human person? How many professors of faith cut off every relationship that is unhealthy or unaffirming of their choices? How many will readily go to the broken as a benefactor, knowing that such will never challenge them in their own sins, but will immediately flee anyone who rebukes their sin as unloving, uncaring, and legalistic. Maybe they are. (laughs) So love them and seek to bring them to a place of righteous love through relationship. Brothers and sisters, let this convict all of us. Jesus accepted the betrayal of our own sins last week when he went to the garden, when he presented himself, and when he accepted the Father's will for him, that he would pay for our sins last week, back then, in advance. And then we look at someone who has wounded us and say, Yeah, but no, not doing that. (laughs) He has commanded us to love one another with the same love that he showed us. Yet, somehow we are vindicated in our isolation of ourselves from each other over an unloving word, an outburst of anger, or even a past betrayal. You know what? We're all going to hurt each other. We're sinners. We have the law of sin living with us in our flesh until such time as glorious day we, we go to glory and in the resurrection receive bodies that have none of that taint of sin in them, none of that desire or urging after that which destroys. We're going to hurt each other. So what are we going to do when someone sins against us? Will we seek restoration? Or will we ignore it? Will we put it aside, pretend it's not there, and just isolate and insulate ourselves from the pain of that relationship? Will we seek their souls by caring enough about them that we would swim against the currents of our own desires and do the thing that God wants us to do, which is to seek their restoration in their repentance to us. And (laughs) if they won't do that with us, then keep going until such time as by God's grace they might be restored, even if that means doing that thing which Paul presents to us numerous times, having done which were the words of Christ, handing such a one over to Satan that perhaps they might be restored, that it might save their souls, that they might indeed be brought to repentance by not being encouraged in unrepentant sin. Is that hard? Yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard. It's way easier to just ignore our problems, and it's way easier to just isolate ourselves so that that problem no longer hurts us, as though that would actually make it go away. Yes, will you get hurt in this process? Absolutely. It's heart-wrenching, draining. It's, It's beyond difficult to actually fight for one another's souls and good. Of course it is. Might you have to then, if you approach these things where you have grievance, 
confront possibly the fact that you need to repent also because you are a huge part of the problem just as they are? Or might you even have to confront the fact that the things that you hold against them are wrong, that they're wrongly held because they didn't actually sin, they only wounded the idol that you worshipped? <laughs> I mean, we know that's true. Look, this is one of those sermons where I'm going to have probably several people say, you, you were preaching that at me. You were thinking about me. Yeah, you're right. I was all of you and me and people who are not here who all have this problem because it's inescapable. That is indwelling sin in us. We don't love enough in our nature to be willing to suffer for one another the way that Christ suffered for us. We need his help. We need to repent of our self-love. We need to beg God for the strength to do these things which are utterly unnatural for us to do. It's hard. It's actually harder with one another, with fellow professors of faith in Christ and true believers than it is with the world. It's a funny thing, but it's not actually all that hard to accept the wounds of an enemy unless we're idolaters of ourselves and we, we hate that we've been wounded because we are our own gods. Um, if we are in Christ and we have a right relationship of humility towards him, then yeah, it hurts to be hurt by somebody who is an enemy. The wounds still sting, clearly. Um, it's not easy to face the anger, rejection, defamation, ridicule, or even physical harm from somebody if just because they don't claim to be a Christian. But if our head is right, then when that happens, we recognize that they are a slave to their own sin. We pity them. We pray for them out of, out of pity because they have no strength to do anything other than to be destroyed by their sin. It's really hard when somebody is a brother and a sister and they sin against us like we sin against them. <laughs> to then seek restoration because, yeah, they do know better. And they ought not to have done that. Even in the case of loved ones, if you have a loved one who isn't a believer and doesn't claim to be, it is a lot easier to embrace them and love them in spite of their wounds against you than when they are a believer and they wound you. That's really hard. Well, Jesus took the cup of God's wrath for us. We proclaim our thanksgiving for that sacrifice, and he paid the full price for every sin that we will have ever committed on the day of our death. Are we willing to actually live according to the attitude that he had when he went to Gethsemane for us, when he approached the soldiers and said, I am he, and when he accepted the Father's will? He did it for a reason that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me. Christians, do you want to reach the world? Then let us first reach one another. Let us be vulnerable. Let us confront our sins. Let us go forward in the pain and difficulty of that for each other's sake. Let us accept reproof with openness to be corrected. Let us die to ourselves for the sake of each other. But moreover, let us make sure that we are truly Christians and not hidden reefs at anyone's love feast. Let us make sure we are not hidden reefs at the love feast we are about to enjoy together. May the Holy Spirit reveal in us unrepentant sins in our hearts, the habits of sin that we are not relenting in the unforgiveness and bitterness we cling to and surrender these things at the foot of the cross for the sake of the gospel and our Lord. If need be, let us meet with those we have sinned against or who have sinned against us and let us 
Repent or seek reconciliation through repentance before we break bread together. Let us go out into the world as those who have no hindrances of clinging sin that would make mockery of the gospel that we are trying to proclaim to that same world. And to those who find themselves as yet in sin and slavery to sin and the fear of death, Christ walked to that garden swimming against all his own fears and temptations to turn aside. He announced himself to those that he knew planned his torture and death. He accepted it all for union with you and that you might have union with us together with him. You do not need to be alone anymore. You do not need to be powerless anymore. Only ask him that you may be made like him. Repent of your evils and they will be removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Be baptized as an appeal for a clean conscience and let the weight of it all fall off and join us in the journey into the light. Let us walk to the light together and seek God's face. Let's pray. Dear Father, we have such need of you for these things. They are they are a raging torrent, a riptide. We find ourselves caught in the undertow sometimes of our own sin, dragged away, scraped ap- across the seashells and the rocks, and drawn away from ourselves and can't find our footing. Lord, would you, by your strength, would you strengthen us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might do these things which are so hard, even as we seek to have the attitude that, that your son had when he went to the garden for us. He went, he accepted, he actively chose to participate in that, his own betrayal, by relenting to your will and going where it would happen for us. But even convincing those who were in fear of him that he would not harm them so that they would have the strength to arrest him. Lord, would you grant us such boldness in our striving after one another and after holiness. Would you convict us? Lord, would not one of us, by your grace, walk away from here without the Holy Spirit laying firmly upon our hearts wherever we have not repented of clinging sin where there is a habit of sin that we have continued in let us not walk into condemnation and hell unknowingly because of our self-deception convince us we pray convict us and lead us into repentance and father may we be found willing in what has been shown to repent God, help us make us to be a light that shines in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.